selamat siang. Anda kembali lagi dalam Tech Conference 2021 dengan tema Future 5G, Global Connectivity, Cloud Computing, and Internet of Things. Dan selanjutnya, Bapak-Ibu hadirin sekalian, pemirsa, kami akan menghadirkan pembicara kita selanjutnya, yakni telah bergubung, bergabung bersama kami secara eksklusif di studio, Miss Pandu Sastro Wardoyo, Chief Executive Officer dari Debayo Network. Hello, Miss Pandu, a very good afternoon to you. Hello, good afternoon, happy to be here. Yes, please, the stage is yours, Miss Pandu. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, my name is Pandu Sastro Wardoyo, and I am actually going to be presenting today about the Debayo Network. I have spent about 12 years in the IT and blockchain space, and I have created five companies in the space. And uh, these companies uh, include Blockchain Zoo, Blocksphere, the Indonesian Blockchain Association, and also the Bio Network. And uh, we are going to be focusing on that for the moment. I have not always been an IT person. I actually started as an environmental engineer, um, but then I moved over to uh, my work uh, basically was uh, spending six years in IBM and uh, selling servers, selling storage devices, selling networking things. But then I decided in 2017 that I really liked blockchain technologies and I really liked decentralization and I wanted to contribute to the world and to Indonesia, of course, um, regarding decentralization and decentralize uh, a lot of things. Now, the reason why I think decentralization is very important is that there are several general problems of centralization. Centralization has issues. We might not realize that there are issues, but the issues are there. When you look at the computing history, the, uh, the entire computing history of mankind, we begin with something that is very, very decentralized. In the 1920s, accounting machines. Accounting machines were everywhere. They were used by a lot of companies. They were decentralized. They were also not networked together. Each of these machines have different data. And then came in 1950s, the era of mainframes. And of course, people know what mainframes are, large computers, and connected to it, a lot of terminals, that is centralization. And then the PC era, or the personal computing era, in the 1980s came. And back then, that was also decentralization. Everyone had their own hobby computer. Everyone did their own thing. There were some internetworking available, but those are Archie, IRC, DCC. A lot of them are very, very decentralized. And then evolution of the computing infrastructure came into the client-server model. Larger computers, some mainframes, some are smaller than mainframes, they're connected to little computers. Right? And the idea behind that is centralizing everything again. We are now at the era of the internet. Everyone is using internetworking. And internet is made, at least from a protocol perspective, to be decentralized. It just became centralized again because of the larger companies that are dominant in this space that keep the data in centralized entities, centralized databases, and that is centralization. This I call the recentralization cycle from decentralization to centralized, to decentralization, to centralized, back and forth, back and forth. And there are issues with the centralization part, in my opinion. First of all, is the issue of security. The idea behind having centralized databases keep all of your data in one place makes it a honeypot problem because hackers are very, very interested in getting this set of data. This has happened multiple times before. In Singapore, in Indonesia as well. One focus, and this is very related to the bio, is that in 2018, the Sing Health incident or the Sing Health hack happened, where in fact, even the prime minister's data was taken by a bunch of hackers, and that became a huge issue. Electronic medical records were taken, cross-reference with KYC. So that became an issue, and that is where we are at the moment. And there are other issues as well. Security is the major one. There's also the issue of bias. There's also the issue of interdependency. And the way we uh, actually create the bio and the way we create solutions within this infrastructure is also the issue of incentives. Here's the thing. 
at the beginning of decentralization, uh, we had programs such as SETI, SETI at home. Um, we also had programs like Folding at home. These are protein folding applications which were decentralized. Or uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence which was decentralized. Those of you old enough might remember that this was programs run in the background of your PCs, of your computers, that, these, that collaborating with all the other nodes in the network think about ways to fold protein better or try. Now, the thing is, there's no benefit to doing that. There's no incentive to actually do that, which is why it never took off. Decentralization was there. People were doing it in their PCs, but no one is getting any benefit from it. That's why the primary element of a truly decentralized system, because it's a system of incentives, we need blockchain. Blockchain, of course, came from Bitcoin. Blockchain is not just Bitcoin. There's a ton of things we can create on the blockchain. The blockchain itself is programmable. The blockchain itself is not just one blockchain. There are multiple blockchains involved. The idea behind having blockchain have crypto is not just a money game. It's not just to create value out of thin air. It is actually to ensure you have trust in the system. And the system gives incentives to you as the person who hosts these systems. The idea behind blockchain is actually quite simple. How do we take a physical object and turn it into a digital object? Or how do we create a digital object with the same behaviors of a physical object? Physical to digital bridges. Okay? A digital object outside of the blockchain is super copyable, very easy to copy. I can give you a file, that MP3 file can be copied, you can sell it, you can do things with it. If it's a physical object, like in this example, a diamond, you're giving your friend the diamond, you know exactly where the diamond is. It's no longer with you, it's with your friend. Now, blockchain allows digital objects to behave in the exact same way as physical objects, which is, to think about it, that's insane because digital objects are supposed to be copyable. But blockchain is not like that. There is a ledger that takes care of everything. There is a ledger that takes care of every location of digital objects. And that ledger, unlike ledgers that are shared, unlike ledgers that are um, basically using a third party, these ledgers are everywhere. When you are running a public blockchain node, you're part of tens of thousands, usually, of nodes, of servers, that are all writing together, all of the transactions. Which means if you try to fake a transaction, or if you try to say that, hey, you know what? I have this, it's not yours, it's mine. Then it would be very, very difficult because you have to convince not just one person, not just two people, thousands of people, in most cases. And that is why it's a very good fit for bioinformatics. Here's the thing. Your DNA is the most valuable thing, valuable piece of data that you have. It is digital. When you sequence your genes, you are actually transforming your physical data into digital data, a physical to digital bridge when that DNA is already digital, it's already there. That digital set of data needs to be kept connected to you. The thing is, without blockchain, that is almost impossible. And when you're sequencing your DNA with the services out there for personal genetic testing, those services basically get your data. And that data is basically used for many other things. In fact, a Time article, very recent, within the last couple of years, mentioned that 23andMe, the major personal genetic testing company, is 33% owned by GlaxoSmithKline, which is a major drug company, and that there are questions regarding the consent of users to have their data used to research medicine. Here's the, here's the thing. Medicine is a billion dollar industry. We know that we're in the pandemic right now. A lot of these research are based 
on genetics, pharmacogenetics, computer-aided drug design. All of these things are together. The idea behind value being focused, centralized to just those people, to just the industries without flowing back to the users, is an idea that doesn't strike correctly for me. Another issue is, of course, privacy. A lot of these systems are using a combination between KYC and DNA or biomedical data. That connection is scary. As in the example of Singapore at the beginning of this presentation, that example, connecting KYC with DNA can be used to break your privacy. Future biomarkers can tell people whether you're fit for a job, whether your personality is good, whether you can get this insurance policy, or do you deserve a higher premium? And that is quite, in our opinion, scary. Hence, the bio. The bio is the decentralized bio network. So the URL is dbio.network. We are anonymous first. We allow people to test their genes, do biomedical testing anonymously, and receive the results fully anonymously and sovereign only to you. And we allow you to monetize that medical data set. I'll show you how in a minute, but I'll, I want to explain why and who is actually in this team. My uh, chief science officer, Ibnu, um, had the idea together with me. Arif had the idea for EMR. He is our strategic advisor for EMR. Kevin and um, a lot of the other team members are actually PhDs and doctors. We have a CIO of uh, one of the largest companies, uh, the largest hospitals in Indonesia. And uh, the team uh, includes PhDs, medical doctors, and uh, I see that it's, the screen isn't changing. But yeah, the, this is already the next slide, which is the advisor slide. Okay, so uh, Carly Maitha, Teza Pelondo, Kresna Suchandra, Hendi Wijaya, Marcelina Irasonia, Agus Mutamakin, and Poppy Satiani are our advisors. Um, they are uh, CIO of one of the major hospitals in Indonesia. They are also uh, including researchers in bioinformatics, genomics, uh, molecular biology, and also doctors as well. So we had the idea of anonymously letting you control and monetize your genetic and biomedical data. Okay. How do we do it? We look at the trends. There are a lot of challenges in the space, mostly about flowing value back and also bringing um, testing into everyone, making sure that it's democratic. At the same time, there's a huge opportunity here. That opportunity is that market is about $18.6 billion, at least by 2025. It's currently about $13 billion. The growth is actually amazing, and it's heightened because of COVID, because of the pandemic. At the same time, there is actually an opportunity here to address this market because 47% of genetic testing consumers are very concerned about their privacy. This leads us to our objectives. We want to democratize direct-to-consumer genetics and biomedical testing. We want to ensure that we can empower labs of all sizes. We want to ensure that we can have anonymous first at home biomedical testing. We want to ensure that there is a data marketplace where people can sell data in an aggregated way, but it is private to them, and the data never flows to the people who buy, but they get benefits from the data. Here's how we do it. And this is the main app architecture, the main flow. It starts with the user downloading our application or opening our site. And that application, that web app, basically connects you to the blockchain. Once you have your own private key, and you keep your own private key, you can basically say, hey, what are labs in my area? Are there any labs in my area? If there are no labs in the area, you can request for the labs to come. But if there is a lab, you can directly see what are the services, whether it's personal genetic testing, whether it's any medical testing, 
you can choose which one you want to buy. You buy, you basically pay in a decentralized way as well. And at, after that, the application basically tells you what to do. What you do is you do DIY sampling. We are in collaboration with DIYbio.org. Uh, uh, we're a member of that community. Um, and we are using techniques uh, gotten from there. But actually, it's quite easy. It's not really that hard. Personal genetic testing starts with a swab. And this swab can be just swabbing the insides of your cheek 10 times. Then sending over the resulting sample, resulting swab, into an envelope. You put into an envelope, you write on it basically a code. That code represents your public key and also represents your sample. This is sent to the lab that you chose via mail, regular mail. And there's no name, there's no KYC required, yet you are already paying as well. That payment is held via escrow until the services are delivered. The lab take the envelope, write down the code, put it on their side of the application. And after that is done, there is a connection through the blockchain between you and the lab. The lab do their wet work. They take the sample, they uh, do sequencing, they do analytics, and at the end of that process, they send back a report or your full genome. The way it's sent is, it is this is encrypted first with your public key. Because of asymmetric encryption, that public key ensures that that set of data is not readable by any other person except you. You're the only one who can take a look at the data. This makes the data sovereign. The sovereign data set is then offered to be sent back into the system, sold into the system, um, and get bounties for it, and sold into a data marketplace. The idea behind it all is that payment mechanisms for the users are done re doing regular stable coins, and you receive the Bayou rewards in return. And the data marketplace on the right actually has all of the data sets. Like if it's genetic data that you're selling, it is combined with other genetic data sets. Because of course, when you do analytics, you're not just doing analytics on one set of data, usually, not one gene, usually, not one genome, I mean. You're doing it on multiple. And when you do it on multiple, you are actually using aggregated data sets. No personal data crosses to the data marketplace. The data marketplace itself can use this set of data to actually do activities and actually do analytics, which I will show. The idea behind what we do is, of course, anonymous, but it's anonymous only for the user. For the non-users, basically the laboratories, they can basically come into the system only if they are labs. If they're not labs, they can't come in. The idea is using something called the KILT protocol, which is, uh, which is providing social KYC, which is decentralized KYC, and also something called the token curated, curated attester. It curates labs moving into the system, and when it comes in, when the labs come in, they approve it in a decentralized way. I'm going to go to the next slide. This is a bit more complicated. It's about privacy computing and how we are executing it. Um, you don't have to view the entire slide, but it's fine. The idea being that on the left, all of these aggregated data sets are put in and then connected to the marketplace. You sell on the marketplace. And once someone buys, once a researcher, for example, buys a data token, they can get access to the data token. But they cannot download the data token. They can only send in algorithms to run on the data token. For example, you can ask what is the prevalence of breast cancer in this population, in this genome. And you can do that by looking at the gene that causes breast cancer and then sending it in via algorithm and getting the results back, which means it's private. Privacy computing means that compute is done privately without you actually downloading the set of data, yet you get the results. This is actually amazing for every actor in the ecosystem. First of all, the users, of course, get the entire idea. 
get the entire services and also get the value. The labs get access to a wide market, even in some cases an international market as well. The people who are consuming the data get access to this data set and flow back value to the entire ecosystem, which is, I think, a very good way to do it. Next. Yeah. Um, on the next slide, we see the roadmap. We started an Ethereum back in January 2021, and then we won several awards. We actually won the United Nations uh, SDG Award uh, back in February. We also won an award from IPFS, amazing award. We moved over to Substrate, and I'll explain further about Substrate. Then we moved over to Octopus Network, that was April and May. We have raised a lot of funds uh, so far, uh, including seed rounds and strategic rounds as well. The idea behind DBIO still continues because we continue with the development of the medical part of it, not just genetics, but also biomedical, um, related to everything that's related to electronic medical records as well. We are currently developing the data marketplace and Kilt, and we are going to be launching next month, actually. So this is something that is pre-launch, but we're already doing a lot of things, already doing a lot of stuff uh, that, is, that is amazing. So yeah, this is sort of our partners. Blocksphere is there. Kilt protocol is also there. We are a member of DIY Bio, DIY Biosphere, sphere.dbio.org. We're built on Octopus Network and Near, and we have won multiple awards. Now, this is our technical architecture. I'm going to leave it here because we're not going to go through this. This is, not a, this is a technical conference, but I don't want to go through it too much. But I'm just going to leave it here so people can do a screenshot or a photo. But the idea behind this is actually not just something that is crypto related or blockchain related. These markets are huge because we're not just talking about people who are familiar to crypto. But we are also talking about people who are hospice patients, who are stuck at home, who cannot go out. Because they cannot go out, they need testing. This is the kind of testing that they can do. We're talking about people who are health enthusiasts. They're enthusiastic about their health. They want to make sure that, hey, I, uh, I, I'm at home, I'm under lockdown, but I still am healthy. I know I'm healthy. And we're talking about people who are privacy focused. The market is huge. Total this year is $13.71 billion. The serviceable available market of people who are just privacy preserving, who understand privacy, is according to PwC 47%, which is 6.4 billion. Taking just 1% of that, that's 3.2 million. Yeah. So the and uh, from that we just take 5%. That's quite that's still quite big, 3.2 million. So the idea behind it, the market potential is huge. The technology behind it is bringing us into something called Web3. We start with Web2, Web1, of course, HTML. When it first started, it was amazing. And that actually brought along the dot-com boom. Everyone was creating dot-coms. And we remember that. That was back in the 90s. There's a lot of excitement but it became a bubble. After that bubble, Web 2 was formed. And the difference between Web 1 and Web 2 is that Web 2 was a re-democratization of the internet, meaning users generate content, people generate content. But the thing is, these platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and all of the others, are not owned by the users. The users make the data, they don't own the data, which is why Web3 is super different. It uses the technologies of Web2, but ensures that it's also owned by you. This is very good, but there are still a lot of problems with Web3. The implementation, first of all, is quite small. Not a lot of people know about Web3, except if you're working in the blockchain space. Decentralization has never been the crux of a lot of modern services. But it's actually already there. It's just slow. There are a lot of issues. Sometimes the performance isn't very good. When you look at Ethereum, for example, the gas fees can go up and down. The performance can go up and down. It couldn't be very fast. It can be very slow. 
That's because there's, an, uh, there's a huge problem with Ethereum. People are only creating smart contracts. Whoops. People are only creating smart contracts on Ethereum. They're not optimizing for the entire stack of technologies. They're only talking about the app logic. App logic, under app logic, there's actually runtime consensus and governance, which means that when you're actually implementing a smart contract on Ethereum, Ethereum has the tendency to be not optimized for your workload because it's a general purpose computer for everyone in the world. And it started as a transactional system, which is why DBIO actually created something called an application specific blockchain. This is using substrate technology. And substrate technology basically is a full stack blockchain technology. It's a full blockchain. It's just implementable in a way that is interoperable with other blockchains. The thing is, these um, costs of actually creating a new app chain is quite prohibitive for new entrepreneurs, which is why we're using the Octopus network. The Octopus network is actually built on top of NIR protocol. Now, NIR actually uses a different strategy to combat the issues of Ethereum. It uses sharding. Instead of queues where there's only one compute queue, the NIR protocol has shards where compute is separated, run in parallel. On top of that, the Octopus Network actually creates validators on top of the near protocol smart contracts, which means the expandability, the extensibility, and the scalability of both these technologies are amazing. On top of that, we can create multiple applications. But the applications are not just smart contracts. They're full blockchains. When you're doing an enterprise solution, you're only using smart contracts, you're not optimizing. You need to optimize, and you need to actually go with the best value product, which is the Octopus Network. It has a way to implement app chains infinitely, without any limit, which gives it a lower cost barrier by a factor of 100. And the security is super flexible. The flexibility of the security is because it uses LPOS least proof of state, which means you can size up or size down the security as required. There are multiple things as well that support this use case. Now, this is the bio. The entire stack is, of course, a technology stack. There might be more details to be had. And I'm sure this is just a taste. This is just half an hour of speaking about this. Uh, you can try the demo yourself. It's on screen, demo.dbio network. You can see the code in our GitHub. You can contact us or go to our website. And the way we want to decentralize biology is why our name is dbio, decentralized biology. And that is not just a title, it's a suggestion. In fact, it's an invitation. Thank you. My name is Pandu Saswardeo, and I'm, again, very happy to be here. Thank you very much, Ms. Pandu Sastrawardoyo, the CEO of the Bio Network. Very interesting presentation.